So we've been talking about uh, Babylon the past couple weeks, this mentality, this mindset that was once a place that we read about in the Bible. And it's very, uh, very helpful to us to read the story of Daniel and his friends as they navigate this culture that is very much against them, against their faith. And a lot of times for us, I think we feel that mentality like, hey, as people of faith in Jesus, we don't have favor from the culture around us, from the world around us. And so how do we navigate this, and I've been reading this story, and like Doug said, it's been the humility of these men that get taken to Babylon that has stuck out to me. And it's always their faith, I think, that sticks out to us. We know that Daniel and the lion's den, maybe you've heard about that story, or the three friends in the fire, and we could get to the big faith stuff, but I see this foundation of humility in them as they navigate the Babylonian culture, and we have so much we can learn from how they operate and navigate. So the title today is Humility and a Culture of self-obsession, which is a dangerous thing to preach about for two main reasons. Number one, humility is just not a fan favorite topic at church, right? We're not really like naturally humble as broken human beings and, and fighting to be humble and be humbled is not something that we crave and want all the time. I don't think many of you probably woke up this morning and said, oh Lord, let this be a humbling day in my life. Humble me, give me some humbling moments Please, God. So humility comes from this Latin root, humilis, which basically just means a lowering, a lowering of status, a lowering of pride. And as prideful human beings in our nature, we don't like that. And it makes sense. You go all the way back to original sin, and you can trace, if you ask somebody in one word, how did this whole sin problem start? It's pride. Human beings got asked some questions and started to think, you know what, maybe we shouldn't trust God. Maybe we should be like him. Maybe we should be the shot callers in our lives. So pride entered the picture, and we've been living out of that as humans in our, how we're geared and broken. And in this story, King Nebuchadnezzar, you'll see, he is like the picture of pride played out to an extreme, where he really thinks he is God. And people around him are expendable, and he can do whatever he wants, and everything is about him. And so if pride is at the root of our biggest, greatest problem as human beings, then we should be seeking the opposite of that, which is Humility, but like I said, that's not a ton of fun, which takes me to the second reason why it's dangerous to preach about humility. The first is that you guys, this won't be your favorite sermon. The second is that God is always faithful to deliver sermon stories to whatever you're preaching about. And so I was driving to the airport on Thursday and I was thinking about this sermon I'm like, okay, we've got like, good content from the book of Daniel, but I, like, my, I wanna relate, I wanna be transparent and share some of my humbling experiences in my life. Think it through, like, so what do I go with? I've got many options. Could go to, with middle school baseball, the first time I faced curveballs. So I'm playing in a tournament, it's the bottom of the ninth, my best friend is on third base, and if I get a hit, we tie the game with the chance to keep playing. Three straight curveballs, struck out, sat down on home plate right after that as a little middle schooler, just so defeated, so humble. Freshman year of high school, all the fellas in the room remember the humbling year that was freshman year of high school. For me, I walked in like, I'm gonna be the coolest kid in school, and then I realized I was in the 3% that hadn't start, started puberty yet. I'm looking around like, those are adult men going to my high school. And I immediately was just friend-zoned by every girl in school. I was like everyone's little buddy. Isn't it so cute and kind of ironic that he's here? Yeah. That's a good one. Freshman year of college. Hadn't learned my lesson. Walk onto campus. This is going to be my place. Van Wilder. So I knew a girl a year older than me at the school I went to. And she, I was like a little buddy to her in high school, so she invited me to a party her boyfriend was throwing. He was on the football team. I'm like, here I am, first week of freshman year. Of course I'm going to a football party. <laughs> Happened to have my pride swell up about that and tell all the guys on my floor and showed up to my first ever college party with nine guys, no girls, no beer. And I'm not saying it's right, but that is the code of ethics in, in college partying. <laughs> you gotta check some boxes. And so I, I walk into this party and the guy who was throwing, the look on his face was literally like, he wasn't mad at me, he was like shocked. Like, this, this kid doesn't know how the world works. And I walked out of that party re realizing maybe I wasn't quite the big man on campus that I thought that I was. Ryan and I have been laughing about humbling stories this week. 
Ryan was very faithful to help me, very generous with humbling stories about my life. He was like, hey, if you need one, do you remember that time in college we had a softball game and that girl you really liked was there and then you just played horribly and you were so mad afterward and I was like, "Uh uh-huh, I sure do remember that, that was humbling. Oh, or do you remember the time in college that you decided to take dating seriously for like a week and you got flowers and asked a girl down the street out and she said no? And I was like, yeah, that one's burned in. I remember that. He's like, or do you remember? And I was like, Ryan, why don't, why don't we stop there? I think we're good. Thanks, dude. Why don't you relax? But I have had a lot of humbling moments in my life. You probably have too. But I'm thinking, so I'm at the airport thinking about all this. I'm like, well, what about recently? What's a humbling experience I've had? And as I'm thinking through that, I'm in the security line, longest security line I've ever seen at our airport, and the the dog is there that smells for stuff. And we have to go one at a time. So I walk past the dog, and as I'm getting to the the line again, I hear the dog's paws scrambling on the floor. But I'm thinking it's the person behind me, of course. Obviously, I have nothing with me. Um, And so I, I look back, and the TSA people are all just pointing at me staring. And I'm like, yeah. Homeland Security lady walks over and goes, you need to come with me. Which come with her means I just go to the other part of the line, like on the other side of the little divider, and just stand there for 10 minutes with her while everyone in the longest airport security line ever is just looking at me like, oh my gosh, they found him. (laughs) That's the guy. The dog is so smart. It found the guy. Kids, don't look. He's a criminal. So I'm standing there with the lady and I'm like, so what's the dog smelling for? Which is a brilliant question, like very incriminating. (laughs) She kind of looks at me like, seriously? And, uh, and, but here's, in my mind, okay, so I I had a headband on, my hair was all over the place. As my friend Zach says, I look like a rejected cast member of The Chosen. (laughs) And if you haven't watched that, it's like the best show, like best Christian show ever. You should watch it, I'll plug that. Until I die, it's about Jesus and his disciples. So what he's saying is, you look like a rejected disciple. But I'm standing there thinking, I'm flying to Denver to surprise my dad for his 60th birthday, which, by the way, happy birthday, Dad. I'm wearing Nike Monarchs in his honor, Dad's shoes, because he introduced these to me. He bought about five different editions of Monarchs for me and him through the years to mow our lawn in. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm going to Denver. I know what I look like. This dog has profiled me to be taking some pot back to Denver. And as if the dog can do that, but the lady looks at me when I ask, what's the dog smelling for? And she goes, explosives. (laughs) So in 30 seconds, I've gone from the guy going to my dad's 60th birthday party to Osama bin Laden. (laughs) Everyone's staring like, we're gonna see him on 60 Minutes on Sunday night. Glad they got him. And after a couple more minutes of just awkwardly standing there with the whole airport watching me just stand, the lady's like, are you from Austin? I'm like, Actually, I'm originally from Denver, but I moved here to plant a church three years ago, and on Sunday night, I'm not not gonna be on 60 Minutes. That morning, I'll be on a stage at my church preaching about humility, and here's a picture of my two-year-old son. Isn't he cute? I have so much to live for. I'd never hurt anybody. (laughs) Just trying. Then this guy comes. He takes me through security, like personal detail, because I can't be trusted, and they take all my bags, and I realize my carry-on bag was packed with baby clothes, My nephew was just born, so I took a bunch of my son's old clothes to bring up to them, which is the perfect cover if you're bringing a bomb or drugs on an airplane. It's, oh, there's just a bunch of baby clothes in here. I'm the last guy you'd ever suspect. So they're even looking at me like weirder. And I'm sitting there, all the people are coming through security line, and I'm just right there, but I'm in this roped off potential terrorist area (laughs) by myself. At one point, another guy, the dog picked out another guy, and he comes walking back, and we lock eyes like, you get me moment of solidarity, like, we'll be vindicated. We're not who these people think we are. (laughs) A guy comes over from Homeland Security or whatever. He's like, have you walked across grass recently? I was like, Sherlock Holmes, like, what are you talking about? Of course I have, along with everybody else in this airport. But what I say is, you know what, I have, because I have a huge dog, and I bet that the dog smelled, and he just stops me. He's like, the dog is trained not to smell for other dogs. There's so many times in my life where I'm like, why would an adult say what I'm saying right now? Like, obviously, this genius dog is not just like, oh, that guy must have a dog. He probably is going to blow up something. (laughs) So everybody's judging me, and then eventually, I am vindicated. My wife, I texted her, the the airport dog picked me out. She's like texting me like, what's happening? 
what ended up happening. I'm like, I'm going to Guantanamo Bay. I've been secretly a terrorist all these years. Like, what do you think happened? I'm at my gate. I didn't have anything. I'm innocent. I walk up and they're asking if anyone is willing to gate check your bag, please. And I'm like, take my bag. I don't need it on the plane. It's just baby clothes. Because half the people on my plane are like, he's on our flight. That's the guy from security. He snuck through. Now he's trying to get him to check his bag so that they, it's under the plane. I couldn't explain myself. But it was a very humbling moment when an entire airport is like, that guy's going to get the band back together. He's going to ISIS. He's going. He's, going. he's a terrorist. I'm not. But I had the lowest status you can have at an airport in that moment. So I sat on my, in my seat on the plane and was like, well, thank you, God. You are always faithful to deliver humbling experiences and sermon illustrations. So appreciate you. Our, our humbling moments in life that we all have, we kind of cringe a little bit when we look back on some of them, but I cherish them. I don't know about you, but there's something that feels good when my pride gets checked. When I'm just kind of remembered that I'm not the biggest deal, that I'm just a human being, that I have flaws. Our flesh resists humility, but our souls crave it. Deep down, it's like medicine for us. And it's not, just, it's not like humility is just being low. It's actually about being self-aware in the world of psychology, that you just kind of understand your place and who you are. And you can carry this humility knowing that. And it's something we all bond over, right? It's like a gift to us that maybe sometimes we don't want. And I love to give that gift, especially to my friends, which is why I wanna show you this picture of Doug. If you can, get that on the big screens just to make sure everybody can see it. Perfect. <laughs> Centered. Great. Doug's been making fun of Ryan and I for our puka shell days, and he said that King Nebuchadnezzar looked like me when he became an animal, basically. So I wanted to return the favor. Don't give him too hard of a time. This was taken in 2006, back when Doug was in his 30s. So take it easy on him. And I'm not humbling Ryan today because he doesn't have a reason to be prideful in the first place. So... It's a bonding experience. Welcome to the roast of the Weckenman brothers. Some of you, he is so rude to his friends. He's a pastor. But we are drawn to humility. It bonds us. It's good for us. It's good to laugh at ourselves. And that's why I'm so drawn to Daniel and his friends in this story. Because I see this humility in them, and it stands out so boldly in a culture of self-obsession. Them next to King Nebuchadnezzar is like, oh my gosh, what is different about you? It's shocking how different they are. And Nebuchadnezzar is probably someone you would diagnose with narcissistic personality disorder. He is like pride to the ultimate. Truly believes he's a God. Everything is about him. He's just better than everybody else. So I was talking to a buddy of mine in the world of psychology, like our culture seems very narcissistic. It's very much, you know, this we're better and I'm projecting that I'm better than everybody else. There's a lot of entitlement and a desire to be praised and everything's about me and my success. But as we got talking deeper, he helped me realize that narcissism doesn't really cover it, the full spectrum, because while there is that, and there are people who truly just believe I'm just better than other people, I think the majority of us operate actually out of insecurity. I don't think that we actually think we're better. We just project an image because we know we're not. And so we're posting and we're building a brand about ourselves and everything centered on me. But it's, it's not because I actually believe that everybody needs to know who I am because I'm better. It's because I know deep down how flawed I am. But I've got to cover that up. And we're so afraid to be criticized or be disagreed with. And, and we're very, very fragile. And there's the easy side of pride to see, which is all about magnifying me and I'm just better. But there is this other side of pride that I think is more common, and it's actually thinking very lowly of yourself, but still making yourself the center of attention always. I'm always the problems person. I always need everyone around me. I'm always the one going through something. I'm the one that has all these struggles. I'm the low person that everyone needs to rally around. And if that's you, I'm not trying to beat you up, but that's not humility. It's still self-obsession. It's just the other side of the coin. And we live in a culture that is full of that, and we live in a culture that's going to fuel it, that's gonna tell you, yeah, it is all about you. Your truth, what you want, everything should revolve around you. The secular gospel will just push that in your life, and what it will lead you to is eventually saying, I'm God in my life. I'm the ultimate authority. Everything ends with me. And it doesn't work and we've got a culture full of people that are anxious and depressed and feeling uh, so lost 
because they are putting on themselves to be God, but our worship was never meant for ourselves. But man, does it feel good when everything's about us. Man, is it tempting to hear that cultural, yeah, it's all about you, you're the center of everything. Nobody should be able to disagree with you or tell you anything or challenge you in anything. And so to help us navigate a culture of self-obsession when it comes to humility, I wanna breeze through the story of Daniel and his friends and pick out points for you where I see their humility and it's amazing. And so if you haven't been here the last two weeks or you're not familiar with this story, let me just give you the context again of where we're coming from here, starting in Daniel chapter one, verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen from Judah were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So, I know that's a lot of names, a lot of strange words, but what's happening here is you have a tyrant king who's out conquering the world, and he happens upon Jerusalem, the Israelites, and this is the family that's grown into a nation that the whole Old Testament kind of revolves around. It's the story of God showing himself through these people, and they started with Abraham, and there was Moses and David, and there's glory days and low days, and they finally have reached this point now where they're being taken into exile. They're being taken captive and enslaved by this king to Babylon. And he handpicks some of the young, best and brightest to kind of be directly serving his throne. And I just, as a side note to a church that has a lot of young people in it, if you read this story, what you see is that age is not a limit on what your faith can do. Age is not a limit and it's not an excuse to not be ready to stand up in a moment when somebody of faith is needed. So his whole goal is to Babylonize these guys. He's gonna change the way they think. They're going into the Babylonian educational system. He's gonna change their lifestyle. They have to eat how we eat and drink how we drink. What he's doing is changing their identity. They're, that's what a culture of self-obsession says. Hey, we know everything best here, so you need to become like us. You're not who you think you are. You're not who you say you are. We don't like this whole God that you believe in, and so you're gonna be the way that we say you are. You have a new identity, and as he renames them what he's doing, they're, they're getting humiliated. Not just humbled, but humiliated. Names meant a ton to the Israelites. A name was destiny. It was prophetic. It was in light of God, this is who you are. Nowadays, we just try to make up a new word to name our kid or come up with something unique and cool so they stand out in class, right? But their names meant so much to them. And I wanna show you, here's the, the meanings of their names and then what they were changed to by the Babylonians. So Daniel means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Bel protect his life. So now your, hands is in one of our, your life is in the hands of one of our gods, is what they're saying. Hananiah, the Lord is gracious. Shadrach is his new name under Aku's command, which was the moon god of the Babylonians. Mishael, this one's like just on the nose. Who is like God? So they just changed his name to Meshach. Who is like Aku? Azariah, the Lord is my helper. Abednego, servant of another Babylonian god. So they're now saying your identity is no longer in who you are in light of your God, it's what we say. And that's what this culture is doing to them. They're humiliated. But it's the way that they respond that inspires me because they don't respond how most of us would. They don't just go start cracking skulls and pick a fight pridefully. They don't pridefully withdraw. They don't become Babylon. They don't just start getting like, well, this kind of feels nice, this culture of self-obsession and we can make our way and everything can be about us and we'll serve all these idols and things. They don't become Babylon, they just start navigating this culture of self-obsession with humility. And as believers in a, a Western culture, this is tough for us. We love to win for our faith. We hate to lose for it. We are all obsessed with our rights and what we should get. And these guys just humble themselves and it, it like rubs against you a little bit. I, I think you put some of us in this story in Babylon and we'll kill for our faith. Bring on some Babylonians, but would we willingly humble ourselves and lay our lives down? That's the question. The most effective Christian is the humble one. 
And in this story, you may know about the, the three friends in the fire and Daniel in the lion's den. You may kind of have the surface level idea of those guys didn't take crap from nobody, so neither should we. But if you actually study the story, their pride did not tear down Babylon, their humility built within it. And we are supposed to be people who build within our culture, in our time and place. James calls back to Proverbs when he says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And this story is a front row seat of this. So I, wanna, I got three categories that I see humility building in Babylon. Relationships, influence, and faith. And there's a ton of other things, but these were the three biggest things that stuck out to me. And I couldn't make them all start with the same letter to have a nice alliteration for you. However, the first letter spell riff, so we will riff on humility today, and now you'll never forget it. So dumb. You're welcome. So, relationships. Humility builds relationships. So life begins in Babylon, and Daniel doesn't want to eat the food that they're serving him because this is meat that's been sacrificed to their idols. And he says, I don't want to do that. Listen to how he navigates this. Daniel 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, this may seem very subtle to you, but it stuck out to me, the word asked. Because we live in a world where people of faith are all about telling everybody everything. I'm going to tell you why I'm right and you're wrong, and this humble man just asks. And it's going to feel like maybe to you in this story, like these guys had to tread lightly because they were afraid, but you'll read the story and realize these guys didn't even fear death. But he humbly asks permission of this guy, and what ends up happening is that the guy says, all right, I'll stick my neck out for you, which makes no sense, and they come to a compromise. And I think there's something simply to be said that Daniel was likable to people that believed something totally different than him. And he was humble when he came to them, so this guy has favor upon him. And their, their journey continues. They just start killing it in school, star students, taking AP classes. Daniel 1, 19 and 20, the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. And every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So they're learning a lot of cultural things that they don't agree with or believe in, but it's not changing what they believe, they just are understanding it better than all the people around them. They're gaining an understanding of the place and time they're in and the people that they're living among, and they don't pridefully withdraw, they actually excel. And they're talking to the king now. They start building a bridge of relationship through their excellence, not through their rebellion. We as Christians so often think, oh, we just gotta get away from culture and away from people and, and not associate with anything going on in the world and just go live in a bunker somewhere, which is your pride saying, I'm better than all of them, so I shouldn't have to associate with those heathen Babylonians. But these guys don't do that. A pastor named Chris Hodges says, what we withdraw from, we forfeit the right to speak to. If you're not willing to go sit down with somebody who believes something different than you, lives differently than you think they should, and humble yourself and hear their story and talk to them, then you just don't get a right to have an opinion in their life. Do we care enough about people to do that, to humble ourselves first, to navigate this culture and people that are different than us and believe differently than us? Do we care enough about people to do that? Chris Hodges also says, God didn't call you to be right. He called you to be effective. A challenge, man, Chris is the man. Let's go, Chris. But for a lot of us, we're known as believers, people of faith, as prideful and judgmental because we just lead right away with, here's what's right, here's what you should believe, you're wrong, and we've burned all the materials for the bridge before we even started building it. That's what we are so prone to do. So as these guys start navigating and they're around all of these people and they build relationships through their humility, another thing grows in them, which is empathy, which is such a key in relationships. And you see it in chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, none of his wise men can interpret it. And so his, this is what he decides, well, I'll just kill all of you. That's, that's like self-obsession to a T. Well, I'll just kill you guys, you're not serving me, you're not helping me, so you don't deserve to live. So Daniel steps up to the plate. Daniel 2.24, therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to them, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Daniel stands up for and defends and saves all the wise men who probably bullied him in school, probably looked down on him and talked bad about him because he was an Israelite. He was a captive. He believed in this Yahweh God that was different than all of their gods, and yet he sticks his neck out for them. He has empathy 
for his former classmates. And Nebuchadnezzar's all pumped up. He's like, this Daniel guy, the dream guy. I want you around here. And what Daniel could have done is make it all about himself and say, yeah, I can help you out. You should get rid of all those guys. But he makes the whole thing about God. He says to Nebuchadnezzar, this was not because I have greater wisdom than anybody else. It's because of my God. He centers everything humbly back on God and saves the lives of people who don't believe in him in the process. Humility is this foundation of a bridge of relationship, and it shocks people. It shocks people in a culture of self-obsession. A couple weeks ago, there was a group from our church that went to a restaurant, and due to some miscommunication, and a few people that were associated with the group that were uh, apparently not showing the kindness and generosity that we preach and hope that we all would when we go out places, a lot of the staff at this restaurant was really upset. And they found out that it was a group from a church. And so they took to Google reviews and just blasted us as a church. We got a ton of one-star reviews and you know, comments and emails and stuff. And um, it wasn't at our church. None of our staff was there. So maybe that wasn't the right way for it to be handled. But when he caught wind of it, Doug just drove to the restaurant and handed the managers an apology letter. Humbled himself. Wasn't there, didn't do anything wrong. But he walked in and said, hey, I'm really sorry that people from my church didn't act with the kindness and generosity that I hope they do. And the managers there had no idea what to do with him. Like shocked, like they work in the restaurant industry. If you've ever worked in the restaurant industry, your whole life is just being treated lower because you're serving somebody and their food's three minutes late. And for somebody to walk in and say, I wasn't here, but I'll take the blame here. I'll humble myself and apologize to you. Suddenly there was a great conversation and a bridge of relationship being built right there. That's what humility does. It humanizes us. It erases the idea of enemies. It builds empathy in us, even for people who believe something far different than us. And as the relationship is built, the second thing starts to happen. Humility builds influence. Our culture is obsessed with influence. Everybody wants more. We have a profession now called influencers. And you can make a lot of money doing that. And if that's you, I'm not knocking that. I've seen that be used for a lot of good in a place that a lot of people are paying attention. But all of us have influence on even if it's just a few people around you that you work with or in your family, your neighborhood, on social media. And so let me say this, influence without humility is ineffective noise. We can all pridefully shout our opinions all the time now. Everybody can hear it. We can puff up our image and pridefully show the best of ourselves, or we can go to the other side and just try to get everyone to pay attention to me because I'm so low and I think so badly of myself, but I need everybody's attention. I need to be at the center. We can do that so easily. But the people who I see who humble themselves and they say there's influence in my hand, I'm gonna do whatever I can to use it for the sake of other people actually have an impact out of their influence. So Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. Who do you think he calls? Daniel, the humble captive, now has the king's ear. And this dream is not favorable. Doug talked about this dream last week. It's not favorable to Nebuchadnezzar because what it means, the interpretation that Daniel says to this, this crazy king, he goes, you're gonna be humbled. You're gonna be lowered. But he has built a relationship and influence to just speak truth when it needs to be spoken. And a year later is when Nebuchadnezzar's on his roof pridefully like Babylon is awesome and so am I. Look at this great place. And the next section in my Bible says, is titled The Humiliation of Nebuchadnezzar. He goes out and he lives like an animal. It's this bizarre story. But what's happened here is the humility of Daniel has now led to the humility of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he would have never wished for this. He wouldn't have drawn up this plan for himself, but it saves him. He says with his own mouth, then I praise the most high. This dude has been pushed all the way to the ground and it's where he finds his faith. Then I praise the most high. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. He finds himself on a, in a far better place than on a throne. He's on his knees worshiping the one true God. And we don't get all the rest of his story once he cuts his nails and returns back, but we know that he gets back on the throne and he's a great king. And you can imagine the influence now that his story tells to people of his humbling. This, these are the last words we get from Nebuchadnezzar. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. It's the last thing we hear from him. So humility has led to relationship. It's built relationship. It's now built influence. And finally, it's built faith in Nebuchadnezzar and a bunch of other people. And this is the word that we think of with these guys. We see this courage, this boldness in them. And those might feel like antonyms to humility, but bold, courageous faith is built on a foundation 
of humility. It takes humility to have faith in the first place because it's you saying, I don't have all the answers. I'm gonna put my faith and my trust in a being that I don't fully understand. It's humbling. And there's a lot of people that look at maybe the Christian mindset and say, how prideful are you to say you know the one way in Jesus? But I think about what's the prideful way to live? Is it saying, I don't know all the answers and I can't save myself and I need a savior? Or is it, I know all the answers and there's nothing. I'm the final authority on how everything in the universe works. The Christian is the, or should be the humble one in the way that we approach our lives and knowing it's not all about me, it can't be. I can't do it on my own. And Daniel chapter three is where we see this beautiful picture of faith. For the King Nebuchadnezzar, this is before his humbling, he has built this statue and ordered everyone to worship it, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't. So he's outraged, and here's what happens when he confronts them. This is what they say. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And I've always read this story like they got in his face and told him what he deserved. But the more I read this through the lens of humility, I see being able to say we don't need to defend ourselves is one of the most humble things you can say. Have you ever been in a situation where you're misunderstood or people saying stuff about you and you just don't have the chance to defend yourself or you choose not to, how hard that is? I was like searching for an intercom in the airport just to tell everyone, like, I'm not a terrorist, just a normal guy, I promise. It is so hard to say I don't need to defend myself. But I see such real courage in these men, rooted out of humility to be able to say, hey, I'm secure enough in who I am because I know who my God is that I don't need to defend myself to you. I don't need to pick a fight with you. You're not in control. I know who's on the throne. It's our pride that leads us when we try to justify and self-preserve. And so they say, even if he does not save us, we're still not going to give in. I want that kind of faith, even if faith. To view God so highly that control and self-preservation aren't even a temptation for me. That I just have my eyes so fixed on him that I don't need to defend myself to people. I don't need to pick fights. I can just humbly walk knowing that he's in control. And as they walk into this fire, this wasn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking into the fire. This was Hananiah, the Lord is gracious. This was Mishael, who is like God. Azariah, the Lord is my helper. They never lost their identity and who they were in light of who their God is. And so they humbly walk together. James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up, and he does. Those three walk back out of the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar's looking and he sees a fourth figure that he describes as looking like a son of the gods. Who is protecting these men? What is the power that is with them? And this is what humility does. It builds faith, not just in you, but the people around you because when you're walking in humility, they're not just seeing you anymore. They're seeing the son of God standing with you. And it's this spark for all these people. Humility, building faith in this kingdom because these men said, we don't have to defend ourselves or pick a fight. We know who's on the throne. I want my humility to build relationships like this. Whatever influence my life has, I want it to be rooted out of the humility of knowing God is on the throne and I'm just on my knees worshiping him. And I want it to build even if faith in me and the people around me. But when you turn practical with humility, it's like, be careful what you ask for, right? We say that all the time in church. Be careful what you pray for, humility or patience or whatever it is. And I just say, even if it leads you out into the wilderness like Nebuchadnezzar, better to be there on your knees worshiping the one true God than on a throne in a culture of self-obsession that will lead you to destruction. We do not like to ask for the challenging stuff. But if the challenging stuff makes you look more like Jesus, then you should desperately be seeking it. Because that's what our world needs to see. Even if faith. So I've got three practical ways to build humility in your life. And there's millions but here's three. Pray for somebody else, serve somebody else, obsess over Jesus instead of yourself. Pray for somebody else. Tonight, I challenge you to calendar the next month. 
and every single day on your phone or your planner or whatever you use, write a different name of a person in your life and that day, focus on praying for them. Some coworkers, some neighbors, family members, friends of yours who don't know how good Jesus is, maybe some people that you're in disagreement with or conflict right now, and spend a day praying for them. And I'm not saying praying for yourself is wrong at all, but I imagine it will reshape some humility in your life, build some empathy into you, some faith into you by just simply saying, I'm gonna go to God on behalf of somebody else every single day. Serve somebody else. When I walk into this church, the people that I look up to are the ones who serve and never ask for attention. I show up here early and there's Michael in the cafe, got here super early just to turn the machine on so you could all have coffee hours later. And then I walk in here and there's Scott he came in here this week on his own time to get the lights all ready and help with all the production stuff going on. And there's Katie, ready to just change slides to help guide you through this service. Never gonna ask anybody for a pat on the back. I see Maggie walking with the Ghostbuster backpack, spraying microgerm defense on every single surface in this place to sanitize it. And Reed's taking trash out, keeping this place clean. Jake's out in the 100 degree heat, just waving people in to the parking lot, making you feel welcome when you show up. Megan's in Kids Rock, holding some of your babies so that you have a chance to worship together. I watched 20 people from our church last week just go pull weeds in the heat at Community First Village just to humbly serve a community. And 20 more people out on our back lawn throwing a party in August outside for a bunch of elementary school students in our area. And 10 more go to the Refuge Ranch and just humbly plant trees to make a place feel a little more like home for a bunch of girls who've been rescued from trafficking. And I look at people like that and I go, I'll listen to you. You have influence in my life, you're a leader. Because these are people who understand how big of a deal our God is and they don't care how big of a deal they are in the midst of helping other people realize it. So serve somebody else. Doesn't have to be here. You've got a next door neighbor that desperately needs somebody to build a humble relationship with them. And last, obsess over Jesus instead of yourself. It's the only obsession that will fulfill you and it's the only one that's worth it. And so I wanna get our eyes on Jesus, but I gotta start through the story that you have to talk about if you're talking about Daniel, the lion's den. So way after Nebuchadnezzar, there's another king and his wise men rally together and get him to issue a decree that basically makes it illegal for Daniel to pray to his God. But Daniel still does and so he gets arrested. And the king loves Daniel, of course because he's the faithful, humble servant. And the king says, as Daniel's going into the lion's den, may your God rescue you, because he's probably heard the legendary story of three guys who walked out of a fire. Daniel 6, 17, it says, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own ring and with the rings of the nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. If this dude walks out of this den, then his God is for real is what the king is saying. And centuries later, after Daniel walks out of that den and has prophesied about this son of man who is to come, who they've been anxiously awaiting, this son of man comes and he is God in the flesh, but he confuses everyone because he is so humble. God in the flesh, yet he's associated making, building relationships with the lowliest of people. Kings aren't supposed to be humble. And he starts having influence, this statusless carpenter in the Roman Empire. And he's building faith into the lives of the people around him. But then he gets humiliated. And he's arrested and he's beaten and spit on. And this is not what's supposed to happen to God. Gods aren't meant to be humiliated, they're supposed to be narcissistic and self obsessed. So he's put on a cross, just like Daniel's situation. They roll a stone in front of his den. If this dude walks out of here, then he is God, is what they're saying. And we see this humble king, three days later, that stone is rolled away and he's out and about. Resurrected life, conquered death. Death was never gonna hold him. And it's this trait in Jesus that just draws me to him and baffles me all at the same time that he is so humble. Our God is humble. He humbled himself for us. And we're gonna sing a song right now 
It's called Know You Will. And in the nine, we were singing it, and there's all these lyrics that are like the story of the Israelites, of all of these moments of God showing up and fulfilling his promises. And as we were singing it, I was picturing these three friends walking into the fire, or picturing Daniel walking into this den and hearing these words, you know, our God's been faithful all along. He has us. He fulfills his promises. He is faithful to whatever he's told us. And so we're gonna keep our trust in him walking into this fire, into this lion's den. And even if it doesn't work out how I think it should, I still trust that he knows best. And what these guys didn't even know, this is how strong and amazing their faith was. What they didn't know is what we know, is that God made the ultimate way. They knew stories of walking through the Red Sea. They knew stories of their kingdom. And, and they had this faith that one day he'll get us out of exile. We believe it. We'll humble ourselves in this place in hopes that it will help push along our people being freed again. But Jesus, he comes and frees all of us out of the ultimate exile. We, they didn't know, but God made a way. He made a way through Jesus on the ultimate level. Beyond our circumstances today, whatever's going on in our lives today, Jesus made the ultimate way. And so I just wanna get our eyes onto this humble king as we go into worship. And worship is one of the best ways to find humility. Because it's us just saying, this isn't about me. My praise, my worship was never meant for me, it's for you. And so would you stand to your feet? And as we worship and sing this song and hear this story of our God and know the, the way that he made in Jesus, I wanna fix our eyes on him, our humble king. So would you close your eyes and just hold your hands out, just a, a humble moment of saying, take my thoughts of me and place all of them on you, Jesus. This time is about you. This is from Philippians chapter two. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, humbled himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's just simply thinking of yourself less. And the best way to change your attention and focus is onto Jesus.